Praise God and welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study. This uh, Bible study will help us to get in contact with God and to deepen our walk with him, our relationship and the solitude within our own soul. So let's take a look at the scriptures as we get started. In John 4:14 4, it says, "But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him." a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And really our key verse, Genesis 26, 23. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. We're gonna spend time talking about Beersheba a little bit later. Now this is part one of two lessons, or one lesson in two parts. Um, Let's take a look here. The title of the lesson is, It is Well with My Soul. See the quotations about well. We're going to do a, a, a play on words, which I like to do sometimes. There's different definitions, two main definitions of the word well. Um, going back to um, uh, classic English, back to the... 900 ADs. So uh, we're going to look at both portions or both ways of this word well. We're going to talk about the seven wells for the soul. It's a subtitle, the seven wells for the soul. And we may not get into those tonight, but we um, will finish them up next week. This Well With My Soul is a very famous old hymn by Horatio Spafford. And we're going to take a look at his history. Uh, if you've been in Christian Christianity for very long, you've probably already heard this. But for some, this may be new. So let's take a look at this. Horatio Spafford's life. Uh, he was a son of the uh, gazetteer author. Horatio Gates Spafford and Elizabeth Clark Hewitt Spafford. Spafford, Horatio, uh, the second one who we're going to talk about mainly. Spafford was a lawyer and a senior partner in a large law firm. The Staffords were supporters and friends of evangelist Dwight L. Moody. And many people know who he is. He was famous back at the, in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century. So Spafford invested in real estate north of Chicago in the spring of 1871. So a couple of things. He was fairly well-to-do. Things that seemed to be going well for him. He was a religious man connected with Dwight Moody, and he decided to invest in real estate in the spring of 1871 north of the city of Chicago. However, in October of 1871, there was the great and famous Great Fire of Chicago, which reduced the city to ashes, destroying most of Stafford's investments. Um, well known, uh, maybe some of you have heard of the Chicago Fire by the little kids' song, um, Old Lady Larry's Cow Kicking Over the, the Lantern, causing a vast fire. You know, that's just speculative. Nobody knows that's exactly how it happened or what how it happened, but it was a huge fire that destroyed millions and millions of dollars worth of land. And Stafford was one who suffered from this. A few years after the devastation of the Great Chicago Fire, the family planned a trip to Europe. Late business demands, which were zoning issues that arose from the fire, kept Spafford from joining his wife and four children on a family vacation in England, where his friend D.L. Moody would be preaching. So they were all going to go over to England, uh, to Europe, and uh, hear Pastor Moody speak, and it was going to be a time away, but he got held up, wasn't able to go. So I understand that he was planning on coming a little bit later. Uh, catch up with them, but he sent them on, on ahead. On November 22nd, 
1873, while crossing the Atlantic on the steamship Ville du Havre, uh, Havre, I don't know how to pronounce it, the ship was struck by an iron sailing vessel, killing 226 people, including all of Spafford's daughters. His wife Anna survived the tragedy. Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to Spafford that read, Saved Alone. Soon after that, Spafford got on another sailing vessel and joined his wife. While on the vessel and thinking of his grief, of all of his loss, now financial loss is huge, but even more than that was the loss of his loved ones. That is when he wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Let's read it. Let's read this song. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea bellows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Now in this scripture, the word well is, or scripture, sorry, in this song, this verse, the word well means everything is okay. Everything is going to be fine in my soul. Now through this lesson, like I said, we're going to be using well in both of its definition. One is that everything is good. Everything's fine. Everything's going to be okay. And we're going to connect that concept along with the other definition of the word well, which is a well of water. So let's read on. Notice he wrote this after he had lost his uh, much of his money and lost his four daughters. The chorus says, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Verse number two, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blast, blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my hopeless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of that glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live, if Jordan above me shall roll. No pang shall be mine, for in death as in life, thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. Verse number five, but Lord, tis for thee, for thy coming we wait. The sky, not the grave, is our goal. O trump of the angel, O voice of the Lord, blessed hope, blessed rest of my soul. Isn't it amazing after all the sorrow he had been suffering that he is focusing in and I want to see Jesus. I'm looking forward to seeing you. You have brought peace. You have taken away the burden of my sin. And you have brought me closer to you. But my real goal is to see you face to face. Let's read the last verse. And the Lord has to that day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. And the trumps shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Horatio was looking for the future, even though terrible things were happening all around him. Great sorrow and pain had come to him. Inside, his relationship with God made his soul content. Now, that doesn't mean that he didn't suffer pain. It didn't mean that he wasn't um, heavy with sorrow. It just meant with God, everything's going to be all right. So with that in mind, let's go to the next portion of this lesson. In Genesis 26, verses 15 through 25, we're going to pick this portion of scripture apart a little bit. So here we go. For all the wells which his father's servant had digged in the day. Hang on. I don't know if you realize I just paused the lesson because there was um, someone outside. I'm recording this at my house <laughs> and it was the UPS guy. So I paused, but let's get back into it. 
Verse number 15. For all the will wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. Notice this statement that Abraham had, had dug wells throughout uh, the different regions that he lived in, in the desert and in the dry areas. He dug those wells so that there would be water available for his cattle, for his servants, for his family. And notice this, that the uh, Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth, with earth. The statement down here is each individual has to dig the ancient wells for themselves. The elders can show us where they are, but we must do the work. In order to access the wells, each person has to do it through their own effort. In our first scripture, and we'll get to this a little bit again later towards the end, but Jesus said that the well shall be in him. So we have to work at, and I'm not saying that we are the source. Don't misunderstand. We know that according to that scripture, it was talking about the spirit of God indwelling us. And it would be like a well within us. But what we're going to look at here is that wells are, uh, they take effort. You have to dig them out. You have to commit them yourself to them. The wells of the old days were huge things where people would uh, walk down a circular set of stairs or stairs down to the bottom where the water had seeped up or opened up a way into through the earth so you could get buckets and then you had to walk up again um i know that the, our graphic here shows the well where we're sending down a bucket down on a pulley um but the, i just included that graphic because that's what we're used to when we think of wells but a well is something that had to be dug out and it was deep and it was large and it had to be able to find enough water not just to satisfy one person but to satisfy the thirst of all the family the servants the cattle all the different uh, farm animals and uh, working animals there was a lot to it. it had to be a big deep dug into the earth for the water to be gleaned from it and brought from it. But notice this, we each have to dig them out ourselves. The, our forefathers in the church, the elders, those that have gone on before us, have shown us the way, the deep things of the spirit. They have directed us to the deep things of the word of God. And although listening to preaching or sitting into uh, in Bible study, we will be blessed by what's brought to you, us because it's brought through the spirit and through the word and revelation is brought to us at that time also but there's nothing as deep and as glorious and wonderful as digging the wells for yourself earning it yourself getting it for yourself so like i said they can tell us what they are and they can tell us where to get to but we have to go after them number 16 it says and Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. When we are in submission and obedient, our adversaries understand that we have extreme power and capability. Notice the uh, Abimelech, he told Isaac, Hey, you are so powerful. We don't want you. What, what has happened when they had come, he had come to the region of Gerar? Gerar. Um, uh, he was wealthy, but his wealth and his power kept growing and growing and growing until the king of the city asked him to leave because he kept growing in power. Now, for us in the spirit, uh, the king of our city may want us to leave, but we need to continue to grow. And stay right here in our city. Let's go on. Because, uh, by the way, our enemies are afraid of us. They know that if we really get a hold of what we have and really understand who we are, um, they cannot withstand us. For the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And that's us. 
verse 17 and 18, it says here, And Isaac departed thence and pinched his, pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. First of all, who in the world would stop up wells in a desert? Why did the Philistines do that? Notice it said, after the death of Abraham. It was something about their hatred for Abraham that would make him go and stop a life source. Um, maybe they're afraid their enemies would, would use it. I, I don't know. It's just crazy to me that the Philistines would stop up wells in the desert. But you know what? That's the way our devil works. The, not our devil. The devil works. Our adversary is what I meant to say. Is he wants us to lose. And he's going to do everything possible to get us not to discover the wells of our forefathers. He wants us to, to stop up the wells that we have already dug ourselves. He wants us to become shallow. He wants us to become hardened. He wants us to become dry in our spirit. And so his effort is to distract. His effort is to overload or um, make us busy, busy, busy. Uh, his efforts are to get us to seek after other attractions, whether they be sinful, whether they be hobbies, whatever, to distract us. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with having hobbies. I'm not saying that. But it can become too much where we get distracted and our wells start to dry up or they begin to be filled up. If we do not continue the wells of old, they will be lost. It is our job, just like it was Isaac's job, to go back and redig the wells. It is our job also. We cannot lose the things that were handed down to us to us by our church forefathers, things of the oneness of God, the new birth experience, the revelation of who Jesus, Jesus is, godly and holy living, family and dedication. These things were transmitted to us from our forefathers, and we have to work diligently to retain them, plus the many, many, many other great things that are in the kingdom of God and in the spirit of God. And the last half of verse number 18 says, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. Well, why don't we just come up with, you know, it's a new era. It's a new generation. It's a new time. Let's, let's come up with some new names for it. I've got an explanation for this. He called them by the same names because he had the same experiences. Huh. Think about that. The wells that he dug out. Looking at this spiritually, if we dig out the same experiences that our forefathers had, we'll call them by the same names because it was the same experience. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of spring and water. Other, uh, some translations or, 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 uh, translation of that word springing let me put it that way means is living water you'll read it someplace springing water or living water they found water that was bubbling up it was coming with life and the herdmen of gerar did strive with isaac's herdmen saying the water is ours and he called the name of the well essek which means strife because they strove with him isn't that interesting um the Philistines had filled in the, the wells, and then he redug. It, well, let me step back. The ancients, Abraham, had dug the wells, and I'm sure Isaac was along for many of those diggings. And he watched and he saw how it was done. He even helped participate. Our church, of course, has dug out, dug out spiritual things um, through prayer and dedication and work. And notice what it says here that. That they came and they said, the, the enemies came, those are our wells, we're going to take them. And there was strife between the two. Look at this. When we dedicate ourselves to dig the wells, there will be opposition. The word there, Essek, means strife. 
And when you're trying to get someplace in God, when you're trying to mature, when you're trying to grow, when you're trying to uh, access God to a greater level, to deepen your relationship and your friendship with him, when you are trying to uh, gain more of the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, there will be oppositions when you're digging. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. Now we're going to look a little bit at this. We're going to look at this word Sitna also, this well. Also, there was battle for this well. So keep in mind, when you are trying to dig deeper things in God, when you're trying to get a deeper, more refreshing relationship and stability in your life, first of all, there are going to be things that are coming to try to dissuade you or distract you. There's going to be strife. You're, you may have people that come around. You may have your own flesh that you're contending with. Uh, let's say you, a good example. You're trying to increase your, your time of prayer or you're trying to fast. Um, those kind of things, basic things and uh, elements by which you can dig out a well. And uh, dedicated time for the scripture. That also, those things when you're reaching for those isn't it amazing how many things come to try to distract and how your flesh flares up and says, man, I don't want to fast. I don't want to pray. I don't want to dedicate to read. I want to go play. Or I've got so many valid things that need to be done. He says, he, so he digged another well and this well he named Sitna. And notice this. Brown Shriver and Briggs, a Hebrew definition. The word sitna means strife. Well, that sounds like Essek. Well, but it's different. It has the same meaning, but this is much stronger and deeper. It comes from a word that means accusation or enmity. It is the base word for the word Satan, which is adversary, one who withstands. Notice here. That Sitna, he called this one, the first one was just strife and contention, but this one he almost named Satan. Why? Not because of the well, but because of the fight that went on at the digging of the well. There was strife, there was uh, enmity, there was accusations, there was adversity, there was those that were standing against it. I remember once, uh, many years ago, when I was a young man, and uh, I uh, was just going to school. I didn't have a job or, you know, I had some odd jobs, but I was in high school and I thought, I need to really seek God. I'm going to really dedicate myself. And I went to praying and fasting and it was on one particular long fast, uh, several days. And I was fasting and my wife came to my pastor. My wife, excuse me, <laughs> not in high school. My mother, that was funny. My mother came to my pastor and said, I am concerned about how much Craig is fasting and praying and seeking God. And my pastor's wisdom, he said, he will never have this much opportunity as he does now. As he gets older and gets uh, out in the real world, working and then marrying the children, let him just go for it right now. And I am forever grateful for that wisdom because I was digging out things that have still blessed me to this day. Did the devil like it? No, he did not like it. There were many oppositions. There were different things that came. But when the, we face adversity, you just keep on going. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And from that they strove not. And he called the name of it Reho Rehoboth, or Rehoboth, who knows, which means wide places or streets or ways. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Commitment, which is what digging symbolizes here, commitment to the wells widens our experience, knowledge, and faith in God. It provides new opportunities, ways, through the Spirit, 
fruitfulness will be produced. Notice what he said when you when you press in and work at it and work at it. Um, I believe it is Isaiah. He said, uh, lengthen the cords on your tent, make it bigger, make it wider, because when you're digging wells and you're obtaining the deeper things from God, your person, your inner man, your soul is growing and widening. And through all that growth individually, your experiences and knowledge and faith will begin to develop to greater levels. And it then provides new opportunities or ways, as we saw here, through the Spirit. The Bible says that a man's gift will make a way for him. As we expand the gift of the Spirit, or expand our wisdom, expand our depth, uh, we will become more fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Um, we're going to talk about Beersheba in just a minute, but I want to look at this first Number 25, deep encounters with God become landmark wells. He had this experience, and his experience says, like I was with your forefathers, your father Abraham, I am going to be with you, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to help you. If we have any young ministers listening in today, I want you to know that God is preparing you to be more. As amazing as Abraham was, if you looked at it from the scriptures we read before, Abraham had gone to Gerar, the region of Gerar, and he already had all the wealth of Abraham. Abraham had died. Here you go. It's all handed off to you, Isaac. You have it all. And he was known as a very wealthy and prosperous man. And he went to Gerar, and then God blessed him and things began to grow so much that the king came out and was worried and drove them away and said, I want you to leave. You're going to be you're greater than we are than the whole city. Notice the sequence. And now at Beersheba. God says, now I'm going to bless you. Well, what was all that? Is there possible saint of God? Lighthouse Church that there is before us a blessing, a multiplication, a growth, a revival that God so desires to give us. Yes, we've had good things happen. Yes, we've been having revival. Yes, it's been wonderful walking with God. But just like the blessings that God had given to Abraham and then handed off to Isaac, after Beersheba, God said to Isaac, I'm going to give you a real blessing. And what did he do? He built an altar there. And he called on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there. And he said, this is what I want. This experience of God. This is so memorable and meaningful. And he dug a well. Let's talk about Beersheba now. Beersheba literally is two words. Bear and Sheba. And together they mean a well of an oath. God made a promise there. Did you know that when God gave you the Holy Ghost, he promised that Holy Ghost was the earnest of our inheritance, Ephesians says. The earnest, it was just the Tao payment. It was, in a sense, a promise. It was a promise or an oath that this is just a little bit of heaven right now. And the Holy Ghost, everybody say amen is just like a little bit of heaven. It is phenomenal. It's the greatest thing on earth. It is a well within us bringing up into everlasting life. This promise is bigger than just fun experiences or, or joy that you get when you have the Holy Ghost and and uh, the blessing comes on us and we feel good and happy and, and all those kind of things. I'm not trying to minimize that. Those are wonderful. But it's bigger 
than that. God wants to bless bigger than that. Amen. The two words there, which means a well, well, a pit, or a spring. When it was translated into the English Bible, the same word bear was translated according to how the context was about. So let me ask you this. When you go through a difficult time, do you let it become a well to you or a pit? It depends on your context. When life's difficulties come, are you going to let that be a time that God deepens you? finds out the depths of you, and at the same time, you find out the depths of God, or will you just let it be a pit where you're trapped and it's the pits? It comes from the word barar, which means to dig, but figuratively means to explain. I want you to see this. When you are going, when you're going through difficulties, that's part of the problem. Or the problem is part of the digging of a well were great things and deeper things. I know in my life when I've gone through difficult times, certain certain attitudes, certain thoughts, certain backgrounds, certain learned behaviors, and some of you that know the term life commandments were exposed to me so that I could remove them, fix them, make them better, adjust them, or get rid of them according to what, whatever was best. In those life situations and those difficulties, it became a well. But if we let things heap upon us in difficult times, it could just get us in the pits. Depression. Isolation. Sadness. And it can be overbearing. <laughs> it can be a pit. You get what I'm saying? But when we're in those times, bar to dig, figuratively to explain, God reveals stuff to us in the deep times. God shows us stuff in the deep times. And uh, when we get into the second half of this lesson, uh, uh, the seven wells uh, for the soul, we're going to discover ways where you, whether in good times or bad, you can still work on your well. And in those times, God can reveal or explain or declare or make clear. Um, I've often said at my church that the last 10 years of my spiritual walk have been the greatest expanse and growth out of any of the other 10, five to 10 years I've had. It's just been incredible what God has been doing. And I'm hoping that he's doing the same for you. I know he is for some of you, definitely. And I hope that he is doing the same. Let's go on. Sheba. A primitive cardinal number, seven, as the sacred full one, also adverbial seven times, by extension, an indefinite number. <laughs> uh, I know that Brother Owen Lamp is probably going to enjoy this. The word Beersheba, if you want to look at it, even though it's the well of an oath, its base is seven. Its base is seven, which means complete, which means entire. So. When he made an oath at the well, he was saying, I am going to complete you. I am going to make you whole. I am going to fix the things. I am going to grow and mature and deliver and develop and complete you. To get that, you have to dig the wells. That's why there are seven, and this is where Beersheba came from, or this were the seven wells for the soul. Beersheba. I thought about just naming this lesson Beersheba, but uh, um, I wanted to go a little bit different direction somewhat. The seven wells of the soul. And, you know, um, I think we're going to just stop right there. I will say this as we'll pick up next week but um the seven wells of the soul a lot of that information not all of them actually uh peter scazzaro in the book emotionally healthy spirituality um he only mentioned four 
but through my studies and prayer and from some other books, uh, I put together a group of seven. And so uh, why don't we pray? Lord, we know that you're the power and you're the strength. And that times of difficulty dig deep into our spirits and soul. Just like Horatio, he experienced great adversity and pain. And in that, all became well in his soul. And I pray, Lord, that together, that that uh, during this time of uh, social distancing and, and on and on, uh, being able to gather for church and not being able to gather for church and people uh, getting sick around us and loved ones suffering and, and just all that's going on. We just ask, Lord, that during this whole experience, a great well will be dug within our souls. In Jesus name. Amen. And I'm looking forward to finishing this lesson. We could have stopped, started and gone into a few, but I'd rather just hit all seven at once. So God bless you. Have a good day in Jesus' name.